So what does my time machine look like? How do I send these specimens 500 years into the future? Turns out, there's good news. Time machines exist. We actually have them. They're called natural history museums. <laughs> the purpose of a natural history museum is to send specimens 100, 200, 500 years into the future. Uh, it's a really strange thing in science where most of us think on the time scale of weeks or maybe years uh, as to what's new, what's important. Uh, in this case, we often, in this field where we discover biodiversity, we often make references to literature that's more than 100 years old. We go back and look at specimens that are 100 or 150 years old. It really matters. Scientists who discover and catalog biodiversity think in terms of centuries. Last year, we lost Will Schofield, uh, an eminent biologist studying mosses and liverworts. He was a giant on campus, but probably most people may not even have known who he was. He didn't win a Nobel Prize, um, but uh, he was a giant. He will be remembered in 200 years, absolutely guaranteed, if there are still mosses around and if there are people to talk about mosses. Uh, because every species he described, a reference will be made to him when it's discussed. Um, uh, it's a peculiar field in another way. Not only is it the case that our fame lasts for a long time, but we also feel we need to act quickly. And it's peculiar because in most sciences, our fame as individuals is ephemeral. Okay? Most Nobel Prize winners this year probably, my guess, is going to be forgotten in 100 years. That's my guess. Uh, um, in our case, our names are enduring. But in most sciences, the subjects are enduring, even if our fame isn't. In biodiversity research right now, it seems as if our fame may be enduring, but our subjects may be ephemeral. Uh, and so there's an urgency to this sort of work to find things. So there's bad news, though. It's going to take 500 years of curatorial salaries to send the specimens to the country. Okay? So the question is, is it worth it? Let's think about, uh, for a moment, what other... Uh, investments we might make. And it's really hard to get good figures on this because there's all sorts of investments at different levels and these sorts of efforts. But just looking at the core funding from NASA for space explora exploration, at some points it's been about $20 billion a year uh, in the U.S. So National Science Foundation core efforts towards biodiversity exploration, somewhere around one one thousandth of that. Uh, uh, let's just suppose that I've made an error here by a factor of 10. I think that's a reasonable... Uh, uh, bracket to be conservative, and the, the, the funding of biodiversity exploration is only one one hundredth uh, uh, that for space exploration. It's a little bit peculiar, it seems to me, that we've got so far to go in exploring our own world that we spend this much money exploring other worlds. Now, of course, it's important to explore other worlds, but it seems to me that the balance could be a little bit different. So it seems to me that it's easy to make an argument that it's worth sending things into spending specimens into the future. As a, bio, as a time traveler, as somebody from 500 years in the future, I so much wish you had sent more. <laughs> My gosh, we have so little. Given that, there's, given that we still estimate 500 years from now that there had been you know, 10 or 20 million species, we've got only a tiny fraction of that in terms of specimens 500 years from now. In 500 years, if the Beattie Museum specimens survive, my bet is that they'll be the only trace left of Kukudera Uzet and Tavuli Navara. Because I wouldn't be at all surprised if nobody gets back there and collects more and puts them in some other natural history museum before they go extinct. I wouldn't at all be surprised about that. It's not as if it's an imminent danger that area, but there's a lot of world to cover and there's a lot of uh, danger to various habitats. So it's really important from those of us 500 years into the future that this material come through. And this comes to the last reason that I want to talk about to why to discover new species. It's to know the beauty on Earth, to remember it when it's gone. Or maybe be motivated to save it. And I really think that one of the main tasks that biodiversity researchers have is to expose the beauty of the natural world. And I've talked a lot about beauty so far. It's not maybe what you expected in a talk like this. And there are two reasons I want to, I did, I've done that. One is for those of you who aren't scientists to make you realize that those of us who are scientists have a rational motivation to seek truth, but we have an emotional motivation, most of us, to seek beauty. We are so thrilled to be in this field, partly because we get to see so many beautiful things. Um, the other reason to mention talk, talk about beauty is that 
we would like to think that as a thinking being, ethics drive desires. But both cynically and practically, that's not the way it is. Uh, desires drive ethics. And so I think that whatever you say about practical things and why it's important to say biodiversity, and that's important, it could be a little bit more immediate if people could fall in love with this beautiful earth and that their desires would drive their ethics uh, to save it. So I feel that one of my tasks is to go around telling everybody the wonders of jumping spiders, just as people who study fungi can talk about the wonders of fungi, and people who study um, protists can talk about the wonders of protists, and so forth. So at least, please, as someone from 500 years in the future, we should save these. Of course, it would be much better if we saved these. Much better still to save this. And I want to end now uh, with uh, this uh, recording that I made one evening in the forest. They say that one of the first things to disappear as natural ecosystems go are the sounds, uh, because it doesn't take much to disrupt this. This was a quiet evening, uh, but it was absolutely incredible out there. The forest at dusk is so beautiful in its sounds. This, uh, most of what you hear are insects. Some of them may sound to you like frogs, but a lot of these are insects. Um, uh, there are a few frogs in here. Uh, I'm just going to leave this going for a little while, uh, and you can hear it shift as different groups of insects come in and play their role in the symphony. Um, so thank you. <laughs>